Sure. Okay, so, well, first of all, thank you very much, Saori and everybody else, like for the invitation to sort of come, at least virtually, to go to go back to St. Louis. So, as I said before, so I, I wish I could have been able to go there in person. That would have been very nice. But unfortunately, now there are still like, some strict regulations in the lab that uh, prevents us like to do most of the of the traveling, right? So I'm going to do my best to team up with uh, Saori to give that presentation, which is going to be about the nuclear Josephson effect. So it's definitely going to be about nuclear physics, but I will try to draw some relationship with uh, more general like uh, fermionic systems, such as the ones that we also find in, uh, in, in condensed matter physics. Next slide. Okay, so this is like a, the brief outline. So I will be talking extensively about superconductivity of superfluidity. So I will start by a brief introduction that will not only be brief, but also very personal. So I'm going to try to highlight really like the things that I'm going to be interested in in the context of this talk. And those things are going to be like the, the correlation length of Cooper pair in superconductor and the Josephson effect, right? So then I'm going to see a little bit how that can be related to nuclei, so from uh, from metals, which is where superconductivity has been discovered to, to nuclei. And then I'm going to go on to try to answer the two basic questions that we will address in these talks, which are, what can we say and how can we measure the coherence less of Cooper pairs in nuclei? And also whether some uh, equivalent or parallel of the Josephson effect can be observed in nuclei. And more specifically, we are actually going to make some predictions about what can be observed. Next slide. Oops. Next one. Okay. So this is a very brief, as I said, like introduction to superconductivity. So I guess that most of you know what I'm talking about, right? So uh, superconductivity is a phenomenon that you find in nuclei when you cool them below a critical temperature. And it was first observed in 1911, so a while ago, by uh, Kamerling Onis, which you see here, like on the, on the left. And you see in the middle, like the a famous figure that he actually presented in the original paper in 1911, when the resistance of a mercury sample right, is, uh, is plotted as a function of the temperature of that sample. And what you see here is how the resistance drops almost, I mean, instantaneously, right, or very abruptly to essentially zero within experimental accuracy when the mercury sample crosses what is called the critical temperature. In this case, it's around 4.2 Kelvin. Actually, it's 4.15, but that's the accuracy that they have, right? So they very soon realized that that was a common phenomenon that was found in, uh, in many other metals. So the uh, Kamerling Ones himself, like, found out that superconductivity also happened in lead, for example, in tin and in other metals. And one of the most famous right, effect associated to superconductivity is the existence of persistent currents. Right? So there is a little sketch in the right of what happens when you cool a metal coil below the critical temperature. And what you found is that you can induce currents that essentially last forever without uh, any battery. And when I say forever, I mean, it's really forever. People have estimated the lifetime of those currents or the decay, the characteristics decay times of being larger than the, the age of the universe, right? Uh, next slide. So uh, interestingly, right? So that uh, so this phenomenon has attracted a lot of attention back in the days and still, and still nowadays. And a lot of very smart people actually have struggled to find an explanation to that. And when I say smart people, I'm talking about people like uh, Landau, Ginsburg, the London Brothers, uh, Feynman, but the real uh, theoretical breakthrough that is considered sort of the classic or the standard explanation of superconductivity had to wait for 40 years, more than 40 years after its discovery, right? And this breakthrough is, uh, you have guessed, the BCS theory, which has been named uh, after Bardeen, Cooper, and Schrieffer, who are the guys that actually also received the Nobel Prize for it. So the microscopic explanation of the phenomenon that I just explained, right, is that Below a critical temperature, P sub, P sub C that I introduced in the previous slide, uh, the electrons in the metals uh, tend to form gigantic, like really big, huge, enormous 
uh, correlated pairs, right? When I say enormous, so here I, I give uh, some numbers, right? So the, 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 the correlation length, so the length of the whistle uh, pairs are correlated is of the order of 10 to the fourth Armstrong, right? Which is to be compared with the typical distance between the, 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 the ions of the metallic lattice, which is of the order of the Armstrong, right? So this is, this is really huge. So those electrons uh, pair, um, so the, the, the partner electrons are in what are called time reversal states, right? That are shown here in the upper right sketch. Time reversal states means that the, that the paired electrons have opposite values of their momentum, right? And we design them by nu and nu tilde, which, is, which are the two time reversal states. And they need a small attractive interaction in order to pair. And this small attractive interaction is provided by the interaction of the electrons with the lattice form, right? So it's sort of an induced electron lattice form of interaction that provides the necessary um, binding energy. So now I'm going to talk about some of the characteristics that we want to focus here a little bit more. The first one is that as a consequence of that binding, the energy spectrum of the superconductor display what is called an energy gap, which is a, a minimum energy that you have to provide to the system in order to excite it to the first excited state, as opposed to what happens in the normal phase in which you just have a continuous state, right, over the, the Fermi C that can be excited. For example, you have a continuous uh, spectrum of excitation. Uh, this pairing gap is of the order of the critical temperature, right? This is the reason why you need to cool down superconductors in order to exhibit the behavior. So you need to avoid the thermal excitation to actually overcome that pairing gap. But uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about also what is in the last bullet in the slide, which is the fact, and this is what's really striking, right? Is the fact that all the, su the, 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 the superconducting electrons of uh, uh, bulk of metallic superconductor, so which are like a macroscopic amount of them, are in a single quantum wave function. And this is really like, from a microscopic point of view, the more like striking and sort of important feature of superconductor. It is, you will often hear that the superconductivity is a, a macroscopic, macroscopic manifestation of quantum mechanics. And this is said in this cell, right? So, all of those states, all of those electrons are in a single wave function, right? And I've written here this wave function. I don't want to get too technical, but I just want for you to have like a quick look at, at this wave function and just realize that the wave function is a linear combination, right? Of a, par a pair not have been formed with uh, some probability u squared with uh, a uh, time reversal super pair of electrons with probability B squared. So this is a coherent combination of zero pairs with one pair, right? Which, which is very different, as you know, this is quantum mechanics from saying that we have, say, like 50% of probability of a pair being formed or not. So we have a coherent superposition of a pair existing or not existing. So, of course, it's one of the striking features of the function for example, is it doesn't conserve the number of particles, right? If you want to uh, measure the number of particles of the wave function, you don't get a definite result. It's not an eigen function of the number of particles. But here, I just want to focus again and to insist in the fact that all of the superconducting electrons are in a single, so the superconducting state can be described by a single quantum mechanical wave function. And we go to the next slide. And uh, that said, we are going to talk now about the Josephson effect. So in order to get what is called the Josephson effect, we have to play this little game, right? You take uh, two pieces of uh, superconducting metals, right? You put them together, separated by a very thin insulating layer, some other material. And then this is what is called like a Josephson junction. Okay, so we are going to they know those superconductors by the left big L and the right big R superconductor, again, uh, separated by the insulating layer. And what happens is that when you uh, plug a battery, right, and you impose a constant 
potential between those two superconductors, then all of a sudden an alternating current, right, oscillating current, begins to flow again uh, across the barrier, right? And the manifestation of that current is a microwave radiation. That microwave radiation has a, a frequency which uh, can be related with the energy difference, right, between the left and the right superconductor as imposed by, by the battery. So this is very puzzling unless one realizes that if the left and the right superconductor are actually a quantum system that can be described with a quantum mechanical wave function, the only thing that we're seeing here, right, is a quantum couple to level system. So the quantum mechanical explanation is quite simple. You, we, that the microwave radiation is just the manifestation of the transition between the right and the left uh, superconductor, right? Again, we are talking about a macroscopic quantum phenomenon. Another thing that we have to take into account is that the charge carriers of that, of that current are not single electron, but rather the Cooper pairs. So the Cooper pairs are tunneling as a whole across the, uh, across the junction, across the, insulin, the uh, insulating layer. Next slide. Thank you. But the important thing to realize, okay, yeah, yeah. So the important thing to realize is that this phenomenon goes on uh, as long as the width, and this is critical for the rest of my talk, right? So the width of the insulating layer has to be much smaller than the correlation length. Remember that the correlation length is very large, and I remind you here that it can be estimated very easily from, uh, uh, like, this is an estimation for a, from a simple theory. Uh, it can be estimated to be as, uh, as large as 10 to the 4 Armstrong. Those layers, insulating layers, uh, uh, are of the order of 30 or 40 Armstrong. So they are much smaller than the correlation lens. And in those conditions, and only in these conditions, the Jodeson effect actually occurs. If, and this is again very important, you, you take layers uh, uh, of increasing width and you increase the width up to a point uh, to the, that the insulating layer becomes larger than the correlation length, then uh, the Josephson effect shuts off and you only have a sort of normal, so to say, current of single electron, right, that cross the insulating layer. And in that, in that case, we have uh, an intensity, which, is a, uh, which we call I sub N, which is just a normal current that arises from the tunneling of single electrons. So you don't have microwave radiation because the current is not oscillating anymore, right? It's just a direct current, a DC current. Okay, next slide. Now we're going to talk a little bit about what happened with nuclei. Excellent, so why are we talking about that if this is a talk about nuclear physics? Well, it turns out that it has been realized very early on. And when I say very early on, it's like just a few months after the BCS theory, right? That a similar thing happened in nuclei. The reason why people started to look at that is because one of the characteristics of the BCS theory is that it was expected to be a very general result of the behavior of fermion system over a Fermi C. And of course, a nucleus is also like a fermionic system over a Fermi C, which is formed by all the occupied levels, right? So the first uh, people, one of the first people to actually look at it were Bohr, and Pines, which in 1958, again, a few months after the BCS paper, realized that actually a pairing gap developed in the low-lying spectrum of even, even nuclei, which they correctly interpreted as the fact that uh, when uh, nucleons in a nucleus, right, were able to all pair with a partner nucleon, and that happens with, if you have an even number of nucleons, then you have the pairing gap that we talked before, uh, in, in, in actual nuclei. This is one of the first experimental evidences of the existence of superfluidity in nuclei. But also, and a long time ago, like since the, the, the 30s, almost, like it, people knew, right, like uh, that the odd, uh, odd mass nuclei tended to have a higher energy, right, a higher mass than the neighboring, uh, even, 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 uh, so like the odd even mass aggregate. But also, what was, what was also important is to realize that uh, we had also a quantitative tool to study 
uh, superfluidity or the coherence, the Cooper per coherence in nuclei, which was the two nucleon transfer reaction. Right? And uh, it works as, as following. So uh, when, you, uh, when you drop two correlated neutrons into a superfluid nucleus, right, you form actually the uh, correlated uh, Cooper state in the receiving nucleus and the cross section for that to happen. So that that is so is uh, manifested by the fact that that cross section for that to happen is much larger than the cross section that you would get for an uncorrelated uh, pair of, uh, of, uh, of nuclei, right? So there is what people call an enhancement of the cross section of the two nucleon transfer cross sections with respect to the uncorrelated uh, to the uh, uncorrelated case, to the theoretically uncorrelated case. And that can be studied experimentally and theoretically. And uh, if we go to the next slide, I will, so this is just a, a, a quick uh, demonstration, right? That, that, that can be done. So uh, in the left column, I just flash out some uh, theoretical calculations of two neutron transfer cross sections, right? As compared with experiment for a very different kind of nuclei, right? We have light nuclei, exotic nuclei like lithium-11, stable nuclei like, uh, like, um, like tin uh, and lead. Uh, we have also heavy ion collisions like uh, oxygen and lead. So in all kinds of cases, we can reproduce like, uh, theoretically the two neutron transfer cross section by uh, using a, a, a structure description, which essentially takes advantage of the PCS theory, right? So the PCS theory, in other words, applied to nuclei. So let me also say here uh, quickly that um, an interesting and something that I also I want to I want to stress, an interesting thing about this kind of transfer processes is that since the nuclear coherence length of super pairs is expected or can be estimated to be very large, and I'm using here the same little formula, which is a simple formula that uh, uh, that uses very simple uh, physical arguments that I used in the, in the metals to estimate the coherence length. Right? And, and you can see that it's of the order of 14 Fermi. 14 Fermi is large for a nucleus. Actually, that means that uh, a Cooper pair cannot fit easily into a nucleus. So it, it's, it's, it's sort of squeezed like a rubber ball, right? To fit into the nucleus, because 14 Fermi is, is larger than nuclear dimension. But that means that during the transfer process, right, if you think of it as a successive mechanism in which one nucleon is transferred uh, after the other, while each of the nucleons are in different nuclei, they still maintain that pairing correlation. Right? Because of this, the coherent successive transfer is actually the dominant contribution of the cross sections that I'm showing, right? And I'm just flashing also, like in the last bullet, very schematically the kind of a quantum amplitude that one has to compute in order to get to the cross section. I'm, I'm just trying to walk you through it, right? So we start at the initial state, which is the get to the far right, right? Then the mean field transfer one of the neutrons, say neutron number two, to populate uh, a state, which is phi gamma, in which each neutron is in each one of the nuclei, and then uh, the remaining nucleus uh, nucleon is transferred from uh, phi gamma to phi f with a second action of the mean field uh, potential V of R1. So it's a successive transfer of the two neutrons, and of course we have to sum over all possible intermediate states that can be that that can be for that. But this is this is quantum mechanics. This is sort of you have to sum over all amplitude, right? That can bring us from the initial to the final state. So just I'm just asking you to sort of keep that general structure of the transition matrix in, uh, in your head. Gregory, can I ask a question? Sure. So um, what is the best experimental case for an enhancement in the two nucleon transfer that is ascribed to well, uh, a correlated pair being transferred? What is the best experimental case? Because people have worked on this for a long time and have gone, I think, as I understood it, the evidence was not strong that the- Okay, so the, 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 the one 
one technical difficulty, right? In order to in order to do that, well, there are two technical difficulties. First, you can only experimentally test the physical case. You cannot just you know fool your nucleus to just decide to not be correlated just for the sake of the experiment. So you don't have experimental evidence of the absence of enhancement. So it has to be a theoretical calculation. To get the absolute values of the cross-section, right, is sort of uh, it's tricky and involved, and it ha has not been traditionally easy. But if Saori goes a little bit back in the in the slides, okay, I'm just okay. So that figure to the right is some calculations that I did. Okay, uh, the black curve, the solid curve, is the one using the BCS calculation of what we thought was our best shot as the thin 112 structure. And the dotted curve is uh, the, the calculation done with an uncorrelated pairs of neutrons, of valence neutrons, right? In the okay. sort of, right. So, uh, but, this but is... this is theoretical evidence. So, th that's a factor of 20 or something like that that you get, okay? But of course, you cannot test that experimentally directly because you cannot, again, you cannot ask for the neutrons of T112 uh, to be just be uncorrelated for life. So, so this is, is it always uh, done then in, uh, the best indication in a pickup? In other words, pulling away uh, two neutrons from uh, a heavy nucleus. Both what? Even, you, an even go, heavy nucleus. Uh, both actually, actually, uh, one could argue actually, Lee, that it would be uh, better instead to do that with a PT like to make a collision between two superfluid nuclei, because the problem also here, right, is that the, the, the tritium is hardly superfluid. So if you really want to test a little bit better, you better go to two superfluid nuclei. And actually that is what has been done. If you go to the next slide, sorry, sorry. So here, so the lower right case is an oxygen. I know, but this is lead to eight. Forget about that. This is lead is not superfluid neither. So we could do that with two superfluid nuclei. I think that I, ha I don't have any example here. It might be a little bit better, but I'm going to talk about that in the following slides. Yeah, so okay, it's gonna be a, a little bit deeper. Okay, so this slide is just to say that well, okay. So it seems that there is sort of nuclear superfluidity. You have noticed that I didn't say superconductivity. I said superfluidity in nuclei, right? But after all, nuclei and metals are different in some essential way, right? So here I'm trying to sketch like very basically some of the most important differences. First, uh, the metals are essentially an infinite system for all practical purposes, while nuclei are of course finite. So nuclei already, because they are finite, exhibit a, a, a discrete spectrum, right? So you already have gas in two into the, the naturally that arise because of a spy, special quantization in nuclei, right? So this is one of the differences. The other difference also has to do with what is the origin of the binding interaction, right? Of the binding pairing interaction. As I said before, in the case of metals, the binding interaction essentially arises from the, uh, the electron phonon interaction. So the electrons that interact in, uh, between each other by exchanging lattice phonons. While in nuclei, it is a, uh, uh, almost 50-50, right, uh, mix of the bare interaction, just a strong interaction directly acting between the nucleons, and the induced uh, nucleon surface vibration interaction. So there is also a mechanism by which a nucleon can exchange a collective vibration of the surface of the nucleus. So both of them uh, provide the binding of a nuclear super pair. So taking into account that after all they are different, it is actually natural to ask some questions, quantitative questions. So the first of one that the, the first of the question that I'm going to try to address here is first, can we measure the super pair correlation length in nuclei? I just said that we can estimate it to be of the order of 14 Fermi. This is larger than nuclear dimension. So what does that mean to begin with? And if uh, we decide that it means something, how could we measure it, right? The second one is that we have been talking about nuclear superfluidity because of course, Electric currents cannot be measured inside nuclei, right? But it might be still relevant to wonder whether if there is evidence of nu nuclear superconductivity, right? And related to that 
Second question, we will also try to answer the question of whether we can observe the Josephson effect in nuclei. I remember, I mean, I recall you that the Josephson effect was the emission of gamma rays in a Josephson junction, well, of, of electromagnetic radiation in a Josephson junction, uh, as a consequence of the sloshing back and forth, right, of charge to prepare across an insulating band. So in the next slide, I will try to, okay, so that's the next section. Next slide. So I'm going to start with the sort of the experiment that started all of that, right? So that's actually, we saw that experiment in 2019 in a conference in Venice, but that happened actually in 2013. And what I remember seeing in that conference is the figure that is shown here in the left, right? So what the experiment actually consists in a heavy ion collision between two superfluid nuclei. So it's nickel 60 and tin 116, both of them are superfluid. And they measure both the two particle transfer and the one particle transfer cross section for 12 different bombarding energies. And they decided very insightfully, in my opinion, to plot the one neutron and the two particle transfer cross section as a function not of the bombarding energy, but of the distance of closest approach that those nuclei could reach in the uh, collision process. The way the distance of closest approach is derived, actually sketched here in the little uh, in, in the little figure that I have here. Thank you, Saori. <laughs> so one can actually so the, you see here like the the typical uh, shape of the potential, right? Take into account the Coulomb repulsion between the two heavy ions, and for a given energy, which is uh, here. Uh, uh, like denoted with the letter E, right? The class, there is a classical turning point, right? Which we sort of identify with the closest distance at which the two nuclei can approach to the collision, right? So that means that you are, if you are below that barrier, the uh, transfer has to process through quantum tunneling, okay? Through that barrier. And I guess that you start to see the connection here. Next slide. Okay, so first, this is just to show that we are able to measure, I mean, to calculate and to reproduce the cross-sections that were in that experiment. So we did that little game for all the 12 energies. I'm just showing here, like, four of them, right? And I show the angular distribution of the one neutron transfer cross-section, computed neutron, one neutron transfer cross-section. This is the black dotted curve, right? Uh, the red continuous curve is our theoretical calculation for the neutron transfer cross section. And the points, the black and the red points, are what they measured experimentally, which was the cross sections at 140 degrees in the center of mass system. Right? So, this is just to show that we can do the calculation, uh, theoretical calculations, and reproduce the thing. Next slide. Okay, so now I'm going to argue that. What we are in presence here of a transient Josephson junction, right? So let's start here with a little cartoon in which the nickel and the tin are approaching each other, right? At some time T1. Next slide. Okay, so then at some point they get together for a short period of time and they establish for a very short period of time what we could like call like a very short lived uh, Josephson junction, right? And the, the, the sort of distance at which they, they are is connected also, of course, with that uh, distance of closer approach to zero that I talked about uh, a couple of slides before. And then, next slide. And then, well, the tin and the nickel like separate again, right? Next slide. Okay, so my point is that what we are seeing here in that heavy ion collision is essentially the establishment of that of a Josephson junction of with a dioxide with a insulating layer of width around it, which is around D0, that exists for a very short collision time of the order of 10 to the minus 21 seconds. Okay, uh, next slide. Okay, so now let's see how we can try to extract the coherence length right, from this information. So what we have here, so in the upper figure, those are two axes where I'm going to plot the ratio between the two neutron transfer cross section and the one neutron transfer cross section, right? This is, thank you, sorry. And the horizontal axis is 
the distance of closest approach, right? Uh, that correspond to a specific combating energy. Below, uh, we have a very schematic depic depiction of the Coulomb barrier that is uh, here drawn as a function of the energy above the Coulomb barrier, right? So that energy axis on the, on the left of the below figure is measured with respect to the top of the Coulomb barrier, exactly. So next slide. Okay, so the first thing that we can, so therefore, right, like the, the zero, what we call zero energy in the below figure correspond to uh, a distance of closest approach, which is the radius of the Coulomb barrier, which is 13.2 Fermi or something like that. And that gray area, right, are distances right, that, are that are inside, so to say, the Coulomb barrier. So now we are going to start plotting the, the result. Next slide. Okay. So now for the higher bombarding, no, just, uh, okay. Yeah, it's, it's a cartoon. No, eh, go back. Okay. <laughs> so that's the first point. And we see that the two neutron transfer cross section is of the same order of the one neutron transfer cross section. So that looks like a super fluid kind of behavior, but this is inside. That is, the, there is absorption there. There is imaginary potential. We don't like that. So next slide. Okay, so that's an, uh, a measurement that has been made below the Coulomb barrier, as you can see from the figure below, right? That there is a distance of closest approach here, which is on the order of 13.5. Next slide. Next point, a little bit farther away, but still the ratio between the two particle transfer and one particle transfer is still of the order of unity. Next slide. But then, uh, as we go farther away, each nuclear goes farther away from the other one, the, the ratio falls. Next slide. It falls down. Next slide. And therefore, right, we sort of can, ident can identify what is the distance of closest approach for which the supercurrent stops flowing, which means that the two neutron transfer cross section uh, stops being of the order of the one neutron transfer cross section. Okay, so I have to say that a lot of you, of course, might have a lot of uh, reservations with this figure. This is a little bit poor, right? So we would like to have many more points, for example, more resolution around the actual value of the supposed correlation length. So at this point, maybe that can serve just as a suggestion of something that would be actually very interesting to measure with a little bit more of accuracy, right? But uh, at least that value, the value that we are obtaining here is quite consistent, right? with the estimation that we made before, very crude estimation of 14 Fermi, and also consistent with other calculations that I'm going to show afterwards. So next slide. Okay, and now we are going to talk about the nuclear Josephson effect. Okay, so let's have another little cartoon of what is going on. Go to the next slide, Sabari. Okay, okay, so the two needles are transferred from the tin to the nickel. Next slide. They travel a little bit around the nickel. Next slide. And maybe they can come back to the team, right? Sorry, are they Next. in time reverse conjugate orbits or not? What, sorry? Are they in time reverse conjugate orbits or not? Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Those are Cooper pairs that have been transmitted from the, yeah. So that's not, okay, yeah. I, I know where you're getting. So it would have been nicer <laughs> to draw them in a different way. Yes. So those are Cooper pairs being, being transferred, yeah. Next slide, Sauri. Okay. So what happens though, so you can have that back and forth going on, right? Uh, one has to realize that the neutrons, even though uh, in an isolated fashion, of course they are neutral, they don't have electric charge. They actually have an effective electric charge. You can think of it like this. The, I mean, the simplest uh, way of, of thinking of it is that uh, when the neutrons move, you know, the protons also recoil in a way of cons uh, as to conserve like the center of mass and that recoil of the, of the of the protons can be associated to an effective charge of the neutrons, and it can be very easily calculated with very simple argument. So that going back and forth of the neutron induce an oscillating electric dipole. Next slide. Sorry. Okay, here it is. And that oscillating electric dipole can act. That's essentially an antenna, and it can emit electromagnetic radiation. Okay, so we can expect some gamma ray getting out of there. Next slide. So just when you thought that there weren't gonna be any formulae in this talk, here are some, essentially all of them. 
I apologize, but I think that it's interesting to actually look a little bit up about how we are calculate, going to calculate those emitted gamma, right? So here, it is very, very schematically the way we do calculation. So in the first bullet, right, we have again the two Newton thruster cross section. I'm not going to repeat how we calculate that amplitude. I already said something about it like a few slides ago. Again, remember this is a successive transfer of the two neutrons from the initial nucleus to the last one. But we can also compute that oscillating dipole that has been induced by just inserting, right, in that the sort of a two neutron transfer process, well, the dipole vector, right, which is the position of neutrons one and two. And we have in front of that, uh, of that amplitude also the effective charge of the neutron. All right. But we can also actually calculate the orientation of the dipole, right? The 3D projections of that vector can actually also be computed by inserting into that uh, sort of canonical to neutron transfer amplitude the, uh, the different 3D components of the vector, right? The, the X, the Y, or the Z, or the one, the minus one, or the zero, if you like, uh, other kind of uh, sensorial representation. And we can also estimate the correlation length by looking at what is the mean square radius of the vessel, so mean, well, the mean separation between the neutrons during the transfer process. The fact is that with those sort of elementary uh, amplitudes, we can compute the gamma emission strength function, as this is the lower part of the slide, when I show you, and this is just uh, electromagnetism, right, that tells you what is the amplitude for emitting a photon of polarization Q at a direction theta gamma, as a function of those TDI that I have defined before. So those weird Ds that I have here are just Wigner matrices, right? And you can compute the angular distribution and the polarization of the emitted gamma. And if you look at the last equation here, this is just the gamma strength function. So the probability of seeing one of those Josephson gammas at a specific energy, right? So that delta function that you have here is just conserving energy and it's telling you that uh, uh, the energy of the emitted photon, which is E gamma, has to compensate the bombarding energy, the final energy of your outgoing uh, thin, and the Q value. Okay, this is just, uh, and, uh, and again, you can plot that, that the strength function as a function of the energy of the gamma. Right? We can compute that, and we have, can make quantitative predictions, which we are going to start to see in the next slide. Here it is. So, here are the quantitative predictions, right? So this is a little cartoon again of what would be the uh, nuclear Josephson effect on the left, right? This is sort of kind of a nuclear superconducting circuit, quote unquote. And here the role of the biasing potential of the constant potential is played by the Q value, right? So the, the, the battery that is supplying the necessary energy is the relative motion of those two nuclei and the difference on Fermi energy is driving that uh, that just is on radiation. So here I have purposely depicted in this cartoon uh, the Cooper pair that is being transmitted as being like really stretched, right? So the, again, the correlation length should be large enough for the neutron that is still in the tin and the neutron that has already arrived in the nickel are still pairing correlated, right? Uh, one can do the calculations with the amplitude that I showed before, and one finds in the right our predicted strength function for that gamma emission, right? And I have characterized here the different uh, important quantities. So the centroid in this case, so this, sorry, I should have mentioned that that particular calculation has been made, of course, for a specific bombarding energy. That bombarding energy that we have identified, right, are still being superfluid, but being on the verge of of, of becoming non super sweet. So it's uh, 452 um, MeV in, um, in the lab frame. Okay. So the centroid of that gamma strength function is at 4 MeV. Uh, the integral cross section is a 5.22 microban per steel radian. The reason that it's per steel radian is because that corresponds to the detection of the thing at 140 uh, degrees, which is the experimental uh, setup, right? Uh, the maximum of, uh, of, uh, of that same function is at 1.42 microban, and it has a width. It's not a delta function, so in this case, the Josephson radiation do not have exactly the Josephson frequency. The reason for that 
is because we have a spread in energy that arises because we have a finite collision time, right? So we have uh, a corresponding ascendant in the energy. And also we have some recoil effects, right? It's like as if you were shaking the two superconductors, one across the other, and that, of course, induces uh, some weight. So this is our prediction. Uh, next slide. And I'm always done. We can also predict the uh, the angular distribution or the radiation pattern of the emitted gamma ray, right? And this is depicted in the right hand side of this figure. So that sort of donut, right, is uh, represents where uh, at what angle you are expected to receive those gamma rays. And of course, that radiation pattern, which is observable, is actually connected with the orientation of that oscillating dipole. So we can even predict, right, what is sort of uh, the direction in which the dipole is oscillating. And in principle, that also could provide us some insight on the reaction mechanism. Right? It's sort of as following, you know, the trajectory of the neutrons when they are going from the tin to the nickel. Next slide, and I'm always almost done. So let me just finish, right, with a, a little comment, right? So that, so the first time that we published those results was uh, last year in, a, in, in that paper. And uh, if you go to the next slide, so actually that, so it was commented in, in physics. So it was very nice like the, that the Piotr Majewski, which is also like a specialist in <coughs> super fluidity in, in nuclear in particular, made a, a comment about the paper. But what I wanted to say is that very modestly, I would suggest, right, for him to change a little bit the title of that comment. Uh, next slide. Because I think that one could argue, right, that this is evidence of superconductivity, nuclei rather than superfluidity, right? So we are seeing, we should be able to see the effect of a supercurrent flowing through a Josephson junction. Next slide. And this is just my conclusions that, I mean, I'm not going to go through them, right? But uh, of course, the most important thing is the prediction of that Josephson. Uh, of that uh, Jodeson radiation emission, the possibility of measuring it, and a suggestion also of a way of measuring the correlation, uh, uh, the correlation with the Cooper curve. But most importantly, the last bullet point, right? So all those predictions are still awaiting experimental confirmation. So with the next slide, I'm just going to thank you all and to flash out my collaborators, right? And to leave you with that little cartoon, right? With that thing that sort of summarizes what I just said. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gregory, for this great talk. So now the, the floor is open for questions. So you can uh, um, raise your hand or just unmute yourself. And uh, so we have uh, Wim, first question. Gregory, um, yes. the, the neutrons in tin are SDG and an H11 half coherent mm -hmm. superposition in yes. nickel. It's PF shell. Yes. Um, why don't you propose an experiment with tin on tin, which well, that... should, be, should be much better and give even larger cross sections? So uh, that would be great. But I have to say that actually we just recycled that experiment, right? So that Legnaro experiment, uh, actually, I should have mentioned that, I mean, I should have. Uh, take the advantage of that slide to actually give credit to the people who did the experiment. This is the Leñaro group, right? Uh, they, was, they weren't thinking about that. So they, they were looking at other things. So that was, we just recycled the results. But I agree, of course, it would be very nice to do something like tin on tin. That would be ideal. So can I ask? Um, uh, sure. Uh, so I, I, actually, I was a little bit lost with because on this time reverse conjugate thing, I thought observables would go away, but I'm going to leave that aside. Um, so in a dual neutron transfer, you get a, uh, a cross section, which you can only predict uh, with this correlation. And right. your uh, below barrier, or basically at the barrier, but a little bit below barrier. Right. So, uh, 
uh, you might excite in inelastically a few low-lying states maybe, and you know they're discrete gammas, so you have those. And what you're predicting is some continuous distribution superimposed on the decay of those very low-lying states. That is correct. Okay, so now on your gamma ray spectrum, you right. didn't have an energy axis for your continuous distribution. And I wanna know what the yeah, energy I, scale is. No, no, I have an energy axis. If you, if you go back, uh, Saori, two or three slides. By the way, bravissima, eh, Saori, thank you. Well, I don't know. I mean, I don't see anything on mine. So which, no. uh, which? Go, oh, which yeah, go back, back, go back, back, go back, go back, back. 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 We're here, oh, back here. Here, here, no, ah. there. Mm. See, I, I don't see units. Damn it, you're right. So that's my, my bad. Okay, uh, so the one is 4 MeV, uh, right? Uh, and, well, to the left is zero, and the, the upper... So you're saying a left. distribution that's many MeV wide continuous. It superimposed on the discrete spectra of the low-lying states of the even-even nuclei. And you, you have just described what the experimentalists are right now doing in the, in the simulation, right? So they are looking at the possible background because, I mean, we have, we have proposed an experiment uh, in the Leñaro pack to actually measure that. Uh, and this is exactly what, the, what they were doing, of course. Like, so so like they're gonna that. use, they, they, by the way, they can do tin on tin, tin 112 on tin 112 there and they can do it sub-barrier, and they, they, they could do it at Texas too. Um, and then they're gonna look for a continuous distribution on top of the two plus and four plus, whatever that's they exactly, are. That's exactly correct, yeah. If you go, sorry, if you go Saudi, now that I think about it, if you go a little bit further up, I mean, I have a, a proper, <laughs> properly scaled, like towards the end, actually. <clears throat> So you want me to go towards the end of the talk or the towards beginning? The end of the talk, yes, towards the end of the talk, yeah. He, uh, just before? There is a little before. bit of, of a lag, so yeah. when you see, it's not what I see. Here it is, stop. Here it is. Stop. okay. Here it is. So, uh, yeah, the one of the, 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 the dash dotted one is the one you have to look at. So the, the continuous one is what we call like sort of the reduced strength function, which is by taking away the phase space of the gamma ray, but that, that, it doesn't matter. So the experimentally observed one should be the dash dotted one, uh, Lee. Yeah. And sorry, these are E1 or M1 or what? Those are, I mean, we are just computing the E1s, right? The, the, the induced emission from an uh, dipole oscillation, it's dipole. But of course, one could also compute uh, like the, 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 the quadruple moments and things uh, like so, that. But, so I'm sorry, these are neutrons transported so is yes. this the result of this of the recoiling dipole varying because just because of the mass sloshing back and forth? That is correct. Yeah, that's exactly that. So you have two neutrons that go back and forth from the nickel to the tin, and in each one of those trips, there is an induced dipole, right? Because of the change of the relative position of the center of mass and of the center of charge. And that happens. Are you using an effective charge? I'm using yeah. the, the sort of the geometric. If you go back, uh, Saori, I have the, I think the there is in the equation, but I don't. So, sorry, is it the effective charge of the neutrons in yes. time reverse conjugate orbits together? Or is it just a recoil effect of the mass moving back and forth? Because if it's the latter, you don't want to go to tin, you want to stay in nickels. So, if you go, uh, sorry, if you go a little bit before, uh, Saori. Uh, a couple of slides. Here, here it is. This is, so the, the way, the, here it is the effective charge actually, right? How, and that turns out, I just did a very simple, uh, you know, I, I took the nickel, the tin, the two neutrons, and I computed how the center of, the distance between the center of mass and the center of charge changed when the neutrons went from the tin to the nickel. So it's sort of a purely recoil effect. Okay. Okay. Well, oh, so it's it is re, it's recoil or it's effective charge. Well, it well I call it effective charge. So 
in my view, like the effective charge can arise from polarization effects, which are a little bit more complicated and involved to calculate. And just for, I, I would say, like geometrical effects that have to do with the fact that when you set, you change the, mm -hmm. the, the distribution of mass, but you don't change the distribution of charge, right? There is an in, just a, a change in the, in, the, in the dipole, in the intrinsic dipole of the system, because you just change the relative position of the center of mass and the center of charge. This is used, for example, like the, in, 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 uh, in N-gamma reactions, right? If you have an N-gamma okay, process. So, so, so I, I, I am understanding this as a, as a total recoil, of, recoil effect, that not you could because call it that of some shell model. Uh, Absolutely, exactly. Yeah, it's, it's very simple. It's, I, I should have a backslide about how I calculate that. It's very simple. Yeah, it's no shell model here, no fancy structure, not anything. Right. It's it's just okay, a so then, so then maybe maybe the time reverse conjugate is okay because uh, even because they're going from one to another, the recoil is the same whether they're in going the same way or in time reverse conjugate. And so whereas the effective charges I think might cancel, but the, the fact that it's mass moving means it doesn't matter whether they're in time exactly reverse conjugate. Right. Yeah, this is exact. Of course, one could refine that argument and compute microscopically the, uh, uh, an induced charge due to the polarization of the neutrons on the uh, on the nuclei, right? And that is that will be much more involved. But those effects are probably weaker. Well, I don't know if you comment on that, but uh, and also one can compute many other things, right? One can compute the quadruple uh, the contribution, the the M1. But the thing is that here the dipole is expected to dominate because you have an infinite amount uh, of reservoir of angular momentum. You can always do dipole because, because the angular momentum is taken from the relative motion. So you can, you can always do dipole. So if, if nothing forbids you to do dipole, it's expected to be the dominating one, right? So someone is going to do this experiment? Well, we, we have uh, proposed that, yes, uh, at the, in Leñaro, at the PAX, uh, we still don't know if it's going to be accepted, but uh, we hope so. I'm, I'm going to interject uh, for a split of a second um, and say that this link is going to be open now for discussion, but I wanted to take the opportunity to thank uh, Gregory before we, we leave this link open for further discussion. So um, thank you so much. And uh, as, uh, as I said, uh, uh, this is uh, open, so you guys feel free to um, take this opportunity to ask questions. And I think Wim raised his hands again, but I'm not sure. Thank you, sorry. Yes. So while waiting, um, Gregory. Uh, oh, hi, Bob. I think if from what you gave your collision time and, and what the frequency of your radiation, we're talking about like, Four oscillations on yeah, average. I mean, I, I, yeah, sort of. So we have calculated. We have calculated a lot of things: the number of photons emitted, the number of cycles that you can expect. Uh, I mean, this is just we are preparing. So we have already two publicate publications. We have three more papers like in the oven. So it's, but yeah. So what we found is that the number of uh, oscillations that one can expect right during that the collision time is of the order of some from two to four, something like that. Yeah, two to four, yeah. Okay, well, I'm glad it's over one. <laughs> it's over one. <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay. How does the, the time dependence of it were, um, figure into uh, this, you know, that <laughs> okay. you're... That's a good question. So, as you know, right, we like to do a, a collision theory in a time-independent formalism, right? So, but um, we have also, so there is, a, there is a simple way to introduce time, which we have done, uh, is to, uh, and, and it was, and it's very accurate, actually, it's uh, in the case of heavy ion reactions, it's a semi-classical description in which you have a classical trajectory, right, between the two ions, and you have the quantum mechanical uh, computation of 
the uh, form factor of the, of the actual um, transfer process, right? So you sort of have a time dependent form factor, right? That travels along the classical trajectory and that allows you to introduce in a natural way time. And you can see the, in a sort of Gerankin experiment of the cross section that you would get. So the, the, the flux that you would get as a function of time and you get the, the sort of Josephson oscillation. But it's, you have to actually, I haven't shown that here, but if, if you look at the formula, it's, it, it's there by construction. So it's very, uh, it's very robust. So you have a, in the semi-classical uh, um, description, you have an oscillating phase, uh, a time oscillating phase and the frequency is the inverse of the Kubario. It's, it, it's like that. Okay, uh, one other question about, um... Obviously, you could worry, think about transferring two protons 